Ago. Ame. Ago. Ame. In the tree language of West Africa spoken amongst the Akan peoples, I've called your attention. Ago. You have assured your attention. Ame. We now pour libation for our ancestors who have laid a path of achievement and struggle for us to emulate. A libation is an offering of water or wine or spirits to our ancestors calling on their strength and guidance. In many traditional African societies, no occasion shall commence without libation. I will make a declaration. You will affirm the declaration with a response of your choosing. You may say, Ashe, Yabo, Inshallah, Amen, right on, or any other appropriate response. Let us begin. We will not bow down to injustice. Yeah. We will not bow down to racism. Yes, sir. We will not bow down to exploitation. Amen. We will rise. Amen. We will rise. Amen. We will stand. Amen. But that's it. Thank you. Peace. Good evening. My name is J.R. DeShazo, and I'm the Dean of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. It's my honor to welcome you to the second annual Juneteenth Freedom Summit hosted by the LBJ School and our Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Juneteenth, also called America's Second Independence Day, celebrates Black and African American freedom and aims to educate the public on the history of colonial slavery and how its legacy still impacts our society today. Juneteenth became a state holiday in Texas in 1980, and in 2021, Juneteenth was made a federal holiday, 156 years after the news of President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation reached our very own Galveston, Texas, ending slavery in the United States. I hope on this occasion of celebration, we will also have the opportunity to talk about the design and implementation of public policies that further address the legacy of slavery and the challenges it represents to freedom, justice, and opportunity for all in our community. Our founder and namesake, President Lyndon B. Johnson, signed the Historical Civil Rights Act into law in the summer of 1964 the following year, in his inaugural address to Congress, LBJ wasted no time in making the pursuit of justice a moral issue for our nation. The speech, originally titled The American Promise, is more commonly known as the We Shall Overcome speech now. In it, President Johnson challenged each of us when he said, it is all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy and bigotry of injustice, and we shall overcome. I wanna thank each of you for your participation and support of this Juneteenth celebration by the LBJ School. Thank you. Welcome to the Juneteenth Freedom Summit. My name is Peniel Joseph and I am the Barbara Jordan Chair in Political Values and Ethics uh, and professor of history at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where I'm also Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Uh, this Juneteenth celebration and commemoration features uh, leading thought leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, um, policy experts, uh, elected officials who come together to talk about what Juneteenth means for American democracy. Uh, Juneteenth, 1865, represents a new birth of American freedom uh, when Major General Gordon Granger uh, reported to enslaved African Americans that the Civil War was over and that they were no longer enslaved. When we think about Juneteenth, Juneteenth is not just a part of Black history, 
it's a part of American history and American democracy. Um, two years ago, in light of the racial and political reckoning in the wake of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many other African-Americans, the United States uh, seemed on a hinge point, uh, an inflection point to finally confront uh, racial injustice, the original sin of racial slavery. And in the ensuing two years, we now have a federal holiday for Juneteenth. And so what I hope that this program does is provide us education, a time for reflection, but also steps towards progress. Uh, the only way that we can achieve what Martin Luther King Jr. called a beloved community free of racial and economic injustice and any kind of injustice is by embracing uh, and confronting the parts of American history that for too long have been denied or ignored. So I hope that this uh, Freedom Summit provides all of you with uh, new information, that it challenges you, that it's provocatively inspiring to you to move forward, not just think about the problems and the challenges we face, but the opportunities that lie ahead. Thank you. Hi, I am Sharon B. Lewis, City Council District 1, Galveston, Texas. I bring you greetings from Dr. Craig Brown, Mayor, and the City Council. We're just elated that you want to know about Galveston's connection to Juneteenth. I am standing here at Reedy Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church. And this is critically important because the slaves, after hearing the reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, they came here to these grounds to worship. They came to worship the God who had freed them. In 1863, they worshiped in tents, and then eventually this building or facility was built. And not only is this place critical for the freed slaves, eventually when the building was built in 1867, it was the political activist Norris Wright Cuny from Galveston Island who laid the brick for the foundation in 1867. He was one who fought for equal pay. He later became city council. So Galveston has a true connection to Juneteenth and not only that, but Afro-American history. We invite you to come to see for yourself, to hear, to read, to research, to learn. Galveston, where it all began, it is the birthplace of Juneteenth. Thank you. My earliest memory of Juneteenth as a native Texan, uh, I can't really pinpoint the first time I actually heard the word Juneteenth. It was something I heard on television and by members of my family all throughout my earliest years. But the first real memory I have of celebrating the holiday was one Saturday afternoon when my parents took me to Herman Park, which is a large park in Houston, for a citywide Juneteenth festival. I don't remember that they told me we were going to celebrate Juneteenth. I just remember that it was a big festival and that I went. I was about five or six at the time. And I remember it was very difficult to find parking. And after circling around the park for what felt like forever, I thought we would never find a parking space. We eventually found one. And as we walked to the celebration, I remember the event was packed. There was a sea of Black people, more than I had ever seen before in one space, including at my all-Black church, which, which was pretty large, and in my historically Black neighborhood. I just didn't remember ever seeing that many Black people in one space in the city up to that time. I do remember that people were very happy when I was there. 
I don't remember exactly what they were doing, but there was food and there was music and there was celebration and there was joy all around. At the time, I got a little overwhelmed by all of the people and the whole scene. I was really too young to understand the significance of what I was experiencing. Now, as I got older, I learned more about the holiday and realized the important place that it held for Black Texans. So you can imagine that when I moved away from Texas and realized that other Black people in states as far away as Wisconsin knew the holiday and celebrated it, I was confused. And if I'm being a little honest, as much as I appreciated the love given to the day by Black people living outside of Texas, I was also a little possessive. Juneteenth had always been something that belonged to Black Texans. It belonged to us and it belonged to me. It was about my ancestors and the trials they endured. And I didn't really understand if and how people outside of Texas really understood its significance. Today, I have a different opinion. I recognize how important it is that Black people across the country and the world understand the history of Juneteenth. This is not just a Texas story. It's a global story about the struggle for Black freedom. And I'm glad the world is taking notice of the holiday and that it was made a national holiday. I am not pleased when I see the holiday commodified, but I know that this is inevitable in a capitalistic world. It is important that we make sure young people always understand the historical significance of the day. It is a day to reflect, to celebrate Black people, including their culture, their joy, and their lives. It is also a time to connect with family, friends, and community. But most importantly, it is a time to remember the struggle and the role each of us continues to play in building a more loving and just world. So when I first heard about the Juneteenth holiday, I, I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty surprised. I was surprised and confused. The reason being, we're having a celebration of an event that took place where people were not made aware of their rights, were not made aware of their freedom until almost three years after the fact. And to me, that just representing another dark cloud regarding our country's history when it comes to race, when it comes to African-American people, when it's come to a struggle to make sure that we reflect the values that we hold dear and that we want to live to as Americans. But as I got older and the more I thought about this holiday, I thought to realize why it's a choice of celebration. As a people, what we've had to go through on a variety of different levels to struggle to get to that aspect of freedom is not only something that of substance, something that's significant, but something that has been impactful, not for those generations who are initially created in this country, but for future generations or reverberations carries on. We understand that the fight for democracy, the fight for freedom, the fight for equal rights, isn't something that has just been given and handed as Americans. I mean, we weren't even seen as Americans, you know, initially in this country's history, I think. But the fight to make sure that we are seen, heard, acknowledged, and appreciated has been something that I've been proud to see us as a people drive to, work to, and help bring to fruition. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's been perfect. That doesn't mean that everything's perfect now. But it does mean that you have to be proud that we as a people have never given up, even in the darkest hours, even at the time when we thought there was no hope as to what we could do and hope we can accomplish, we still persevered. And so now, when we're talking about the Juneteenth holiday, we're talking about what that means to not people just here in Texas, but throughout our country, 
that is all inspiring. It is humbling. It is something that we should enjoy and appreciate. It's been different these last several years, you know, with the murder of George Floyd, with what's happened with our economy, with the closing of 40% of black owned businesses, with the disproportionate effect that COVID-19 has had on people of color. It's been a struggle. It's been exhausting a lot of ways. But at the same time, you see what's happening on the other side. You see that we're coming out of it and we're coming out of it stronger. And Juneteenth, that holiday celebrates and acknowledges our strength. Our strength to persevere even during the darkest times. Our strength to acknowledge and have faith in a higher being in one another. When even we thought, is that really the case? Our strength to pass on and set an example for other generations behind us about what it means to not just be a black man or a black woman or a black person, but to be not just a black American, but an American and set the example for what we want future generations to go by. In my, in my career as an attorney, I'm used to always being one of the few in the room. Those of you who are people of color, you know that all too well. People that look like us aren't usually represented in these spaces. And I've also understood and appreciated the excitement, the effort, the, um, the ability to make true systemic change by being that person in the room to help bring others there. I may be the only one there now, but I will create a pipeline, create opportunities for others to make sure that I am not the lost. To making sure that, hey, the things that I've gone through, the next generation won't have to. And the reason I'm able to do that is because of my forefathers, because of the people who set that example in front of me, who set that pathway for that. I've been blessed by my mentors, by those peers who have set the example for me to follow. And I want to look back and I see those who suffered and toiled in the evils of slavery, who persevered and overcame, who celebrated their freedom on that day. I see how they set the pathway for me. And if not for them, not for their actions, for not their beliefs, I wouldn't be where I am today. As the executive director for the Texas Black Caucus Foundation, it's imperative for me to be able to tell that story, to have that understanding to not just black people, not just people of color, but to every American as to the importance of the Juneteenth, as to why it's essential and it is just as important of holiday as any other ones that we do in celebration of our country's history. It started in a dark viewpoint, a dark vantage point, from the ebbs and flows of evil that have gone on in the toils of our history. But what it's created and what it can be is a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, a place where people come together to celebrate our differences, our cast aspersions. When I think of Juneteenth, I think about the future of this country and why it's celebration, why it's important, not just in the public sector, but in the private sector as well, speaks volumes and lights a pathway for people to move forward in this country. I think at Juneteenth, I think it's America. Yeah, that's what makes me proud. Hi, my name is Dr. LaToya Smith. I am the Vice President of the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. And when I think about Juneteenth as someone who has grown up in Texas and is the descendant of enslaved people, um, I have a different connection um, with Juneteenth and maybe some other individuals uh, across our campus. 
Um, when I think about growing up in Texas, I didn't really hear about Juneteenth, um, learning about it in school. Um, I learned about it from my, my parents, but it was limited information. It was usually connected to family reunions or parades, um, but I didn't quite grasp the history, the significance, the meaning of Juneteenth, probably until I went to college. Um, I didn't learn about when it became an official state holiday and, and you know, in the 80s and, and who was behind it until taking a class in college and listening to different speakers and actually even talking to some of my friends and peers who, you know, went to predominantly Black schools and maybe had a history teacher that taught them um, a little bit more about Juneteenth. Um, you know, my cousins participated in parades, and, and as I said, it was a it was a jovial time. Um, it was kind of our version of July 4th. And so I think that's um, why it has such a special meaning for me because of the family connection and the history. But as I've gotten older and I do the work that I do at this institution, I think it's so important that we continue to uplift the research and the history of this country. Um, like I said, I never learned about about it in school. And so I think, you know, when I think about those difficult and uncomfortable times learning about slavery as maybe one of the only Black students in school, um, I didn't learn about Juneteenth. It, it wasn't in a history book that I can remember. And so I think it's it forces us as now a federal holiday to, to talk about it, talk about our history, talk about our history from the perspective of descendants of a enslaved people. But I think it also forces us to recognize and make awareness of the delayed justice and freedom for Black people in this country historically, but even today. Um, and thinking about that there's often a difference between the laws and the lived experiences um, in this country, especially for Black people. You know, and I, I think making it a federal holiday is a step in the right direction. I just want to make sure that it doesn't become uh, commercialized. I think it's important to recognize Juneteenth um, and not only recognize it, and it's great that we have re reunions, but it's also a day of reflection. It's also um, not just about parades, but participation and being present. Um, being an advocate, um, thinking about what you can do to be, I'd say, civically engaged in your community. So, um, you know, that's really what I think about as it relates to Juneteenth. And in my work here as the vice president of, of DDCE, Juneteenth reminds me not only of how much we and, and my ancestors in this country and the state have come through, but also the ways in which we still need to make progress and why our institutional diversity, equity, inclusion plan is so important so that we continue to create spaces where people can learn and exchange ideas and even disagree, but also I think be an institution that is accessible um, for everyone when it has not historically been so. So with that, um, Thank you for this time and this platform to talk about the meaning uh, for Juneteenth uh, for me um, and my connection to Juneteenth. What does Juneteenth mean to me? I think this is a really exciting question to ponder because Juneteenth doesn't mean any one thing to any one person, especially Black identifying Americans, right? And when you actually take the idea of what Juneteenth means to us as a community, it probably helps to really drill down a little bit more specifically into what Juneteenth means to those of us who grew up in the South or had a Southern upbringing or um, have had Southern influence and roots and a, a, a heritage and anchoring that is Southern. Because I think to Southern identifying 
Black folk, African American folk, Juneteenth means something uniquely special. And that certainly doesn't mean that it's not celebratory and should not, uh, and should most definitely be celebrated across all races, ethnicities, regions, nationalities, because it is, as of last year, officially a federally recognized holiday. But I say it's something I think more pointed for those with Southern roots because it was our holiday. It was something that belonged to us before I think it felt a sense of ownership or at least uh, represented a space and place of pride for others. And so I'll speak to that a little bit more specifically in the sense that I remember I grew up between two spaces. I, I grew up, I was born in Florida. I grew up between Texas and New York City. I was always kind of moving between the two. And I say that because it helps to inform my perspective and worldview, right? So I was in some ways like just another girl on the IRT taking the two and the five line. Um, and I was also very much enthusiastically ready to participate in R&B night at the Houston Livestock and Rodeo. I remember those very vivid moments that helped to punctuate my childhood. But along with that, I think are very two culturally significant rites of passages for Black folk, right? Which are um, probably any MLK celebration or ceremony or banquet to which I remember getting dressed for, getting my hair done for, having to recite something. It was almost um, almost something similar to the, the beautiful pomp and circumstance of an Easter Sunday in the Black church. And then along those same lines would be Juneteenth celebrations, which were a little bit different, whereas MLK Day receptions and banquets and programs obviously happened in January. Juneteenth happened in the summer. And most of us were out of school, but there was still the majesty and the magic that it held. There was a spirit of festivity and, and celebration and communal joy, radical joy. But I, I didn't know it was radical at the time. And I think that's what makes it so uniquely special. And again, this sense of, of affectionate ownership over the holiday is that it was very specific, at least during my childhood, to our time, to our community. I grew up south of Houston in Brazoria County, which is very much, um, very much a significant part in the shared history of Juneteenth. And so the magic that I'm referencing meant that entire families and generations of families were involved in the celebration. We were involved in understanding the history we were involved in celebrating what it represented, what it signified for us as a people. We were also, I think, anchored by a sense of shared celebration threaded by shared pain and not necessarily ours directly, but those of our, our elders who since gone on to become our ancestors and what that meant. And the fact that we lived in a community where there was, there was still a plantation. We lived in a community where the residual impact of slavery and the ghosts of the enslaved and even the spirits, the haunting spirits of the enslavers were still present, but there wasn't, there wasn't, I think, intentionality in the public sphere to educate all community members about the significance of this and what it meant and the horrors of it and how it informed who we who we were as a community as an integrated community to a, to a degree right and how it could potentially inform how we progress and advance as an integrated community i think there there was not an equitable amount of attention paid to the significance of that history. But the Black folk, the elders, they did. And even as a child, it was difficult to understand the significance of that. And, and that largely has to do with just a limited worldview and understanding of place and time. But the older that I got and the more grown folk conversations I was able to be a part of, and as my own intellectual understanding grew, I definitely appre appreciated the richness of what we were doing, the radical effort that we were making to be visible, to be present, and to uh, 
to basically insert and assert our visibility and presence in a community, even with, I think, somewhat rather in, intentional or not, efforts to turn down the volume on that visibility and that history, that that horrific history that was muted for a very long time and not a part of the formal structural education that we were receiving in schools. And I think this is an opportunity for me to even reflect with a unique kind of nostalgia and deep appreciation around what our elders did and the responsibility that they had for us in our unique education, in addition to what we were learning or not learning in schools and public schools, but to understand that this was a space where in which the community would take over in our education and make sure that our voices and our stories were amplified and elevated in a way where we were centered. And even though we certainly had to reconcile some of the very tragic, um, injurious, horrible pieces of our past, we were able to do that under the covering of our community who loved us. We loved one another. We nurtured one another. We poured into one another. And I think having that is one of the, the most beautiful legacies of Juneteenth because it goes to show, I think, that there is this consistent undercurrent of intentional care that our ancestors have bequeathed to our elders who then pour into us as the generations that are rising. And hopefully that that will not be diminished, right? Hopefully the richness of that history will not go away, will not will not be muted. Um, and I think we have a responsibility as a community, as a people to make sure it isn't, not just for those who for whom it is less personal, but for those of us for whom it is personal. Because sometimes when things become part of the everyday or the daily discourse, or they become normal or normalized, they can also be taken for granted. And I hope we never take it for granted. I hope we never take the opalese for granted. I hope we never take for granted the aunties, the uncles, the, the community elders um, who were making pound cakes and, 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 and making sure that, that we were nourished in both mind, body, and spirit as we paid homage to our ancestors who came long before us, but made sure that we had a path to follow and a path that led to liberation through their own resilience and grit. And that's something that I think we should hold on to regardless of whether our nation recognizes it for what it truly is or, or, or does not. But I think we've taken some beautifully positive steps forward and having it recognized as a federal holiday. So that's what Juneteenth means to me as part of the larger us. I first remember coming into knowledge of Juneteenth probably early in my high school years. Uh, there was a local park that had an annual Juneteenth festival. Wasn't widely known. It wasn't widely attended. There wasn't a lot of bells and whistles that went into it. It was just kind of community members coming around to cook out, to play games, to eat, to drink, to laugh. But I don't remember too much narrative or discussion around why this was happening. It just felt like a place of respite for community members, for fans, from families to kind of get away from the hardships of life. Time to spend with family, time to spend with friends, time to spend with community members to celebrate each other, to celebrate our resiliency, to, resili to celebrate the dynamic nature of who we are. But it wasn't until later in my high school years that I pushed to have a Black history course taught at my school. I came up short, but they did approve a independent study course for me that uh, Mr. Connors uh, kind of taught or guided me in that work. So it wasn't a course for everybody, but it was something for me. Celebrate that as a win. I don't know, but I did have that experience. And it was in that independent study course that I became much more aware of the elements of my history and my background, those elements that weren't readily taught within the school system. And one of those elements, happened to be Juneteenth. And it was here in my independent study course that I became more aware of the elements and the aspects that surrounded Juneteenth and what had transpired, what had really transpired. 
And I only continued this as I selected uh, African American studies as my minor when I got to college. But part of what I ended up having to dealing with was moving from a place where uh, Juneteenth was a pure celebration of a joyous remembrance of freedom to grappling with acknowledging this two year gap between 1863 and the Emancipation Proclamation where enslaved individuals were free throughout the country to 1865 where freedom is happening here in Texas. And I end up sitting there thinking, do I focus on the freedom and keep it very celebratory, or do you give space to that two year period where a nation attests to the end of slavery, but individuals in the country continue to live in a different reality? This is what Juneteenth kind of brings up for me. It brings up this contradiction within a nation divided where you wanna celebrate the progress being made, but you can't fail to acknowledge that we have a long way to go. Because what we end up, uh, celebrating is something that should have came about a lot sooner. Now I could look at the health in this country. Uh, it brings up a similar feeling for me, living in a wealthy nation that has the technology, that has the resources, that has the education to create a healthy lifestyle and quality of life for everyone, but also knowing that there's these social and structural and political determinants of health and these policies that prevent this from happening. A country that espouses that there's a freedom for anybody to grow up and become a healthcare provider of all types, but seeing the underrepresentation of Black people and people of color as medical doctors and other healthcare professionals. Does Juneteenth become a point of celebration? Is it a point of reflection of what we need to continue to work towards and do to make sure there's not a continued delay in what we eventually celebrate? So does Juneteenth become a point of celebration for finally being freed from a system that has destroyed families and communities and individuals? Or does Juneteenth serve as a time of reflection to understand the ways in which we're still grappling despite the 157 years since Juneteenth took place? Maybe it's a combination of both. I don't really have the answer. And even as I sit here now, it's still a bit of grappling. What do we do with this? Maybe as we celebrate what transpired and the freedom that came, we also create space to grapple with the eerie similarities that still exist and challenge ourselves, commit ourselves, challenge the systems and structures that we operate in to create the change that we should have seen already. So no matter which way you take the holiday this year or next year, or the years to come, I'd encourage you maybe to create space for both points of celebration and points of intentional reflection. So while you're sitting around and you're cooking and you're having great time and joyous time, maybe there are some conversations about what can happen, what should happen and how we can make that happen. So enjoy to Juneteenth, congratulations. And we also have work to do, peace. I'm reflecting on the uh, significance of Juneteenth, 5,000 miles away in the UK. And so I'm thinking about, um, first of all, just the fact that uh, we're at a place where we're commemorating the second uh, celebration of the, uh, of the holiday, which is pretty significant. Uh, I think that's a, a, a huge accomplishment for us as a community, just to know the fact that we are openly discussing and engaging in the history of emancipation in our country and really examining what it means to be African American. What does the promise of freedom in this country actually mean? How is it executed? Um, and I think it's even more salient when you're not in the United States, right? Because you can look at it from a different perspective. Um, I think one thing that's really relevant to me is just the fact that we are also uh, commemorating or observing the fact that uh, we lost George Floyd uh, just a few days ago, actually. Um, the anniversary of his, of his death uh, has rolled around, and it's a good time for us to reflect on what progress we made uh, in things relating to social justice, uh, policing, uh, the presumption of innocence uh, for African Americans. That is something I'm reflecting on quite a bit. And also just the fact that um, 
you know, last year we had a chance to hear from Annette Gordon Reed. Uh, I hope folks have read her book, but um, the salience of discussing Juneteenth and being a Texan and thinking about our history and how our history is often valorized and sort of frankly whitewashed and not truly encompassing the complexities, the frustrations, the broken promises that are part of the American story and the importance of bringing it to the forefront. So certainly for me, uh, Juneteenth is a time of celebration. It's also a time of reflection, um, intense reflection and recognizing the scholarship of folks in our own campus, like Dinah Berry and Peniel Joseph, of course, and certainly the work uh, of folks like Annette Gordon-Reed, who have examined um, our history and, and are bringing to light some uncomfortable truths, but truths nonetheless that need to be discussed in, and, and dialogued about. So in my opinion, this is an opportunity for all of us in the um, American sort of community to think about what does it mean to be a nation that espouses uh, ideals of justice, liberty, and freedom, and how does that actually look in execution uh, for different communities? And we're highlighting what's happened with the African American community at the path of emancipation, but also a time to think about how other communities in this country have or have not have reached that goal of freedom, uh, justice, equality. So I think. Um, I was reflecting the day about the fact that, you know, will we start seeing Juneteenth mattress sales and we start seeing Juneteenth, uh, you know, blow out uh, bargains at the uh, car lot. And I worry about that because this is really, in my opinion, a more somber reflection because it talks a lot about just the importance of embracing our historical narrative and understanding uh, it's a day of jubilation, but it's also a day of reflection and uh, an opportunity for us to reflect on why did it take a thousand days between the Emancipation Proclamation and the word to get to uh, Galveston about emancipation? Um, and what does emancipation look like? And we're in a moment where we're reflecting on uh, historical um, sort of shortcomings, Wilmington riots, the Tulsa riots, and more recently what's happened in Buffalo and, and sadly Uvalde, right? These, these sort of expressions that are contradictory to the ideals of freedom and equality. So uh, right now it's a really interesting time to reflect on it because uh, my heart is heavy thinking about those tragedies that have impacted black communities and more broadly communities of color um, because the work is not done. And anybody who thinks that uh, we should be sitting here and just sort of just celebrating and not thinking about the fact there's so much work to be done I think it's missing a key component of what it means to reflect on Juneteenth and what it means. So um, again, just as somebody who is currently not in the United States, and one of the things about travel that's wonderful is looking at ourselves from another lens. And so um, I'm here with students and we are having an amazing time talking about issues of equity and inclusion in the British system, the American system. We're doing a lot of comparisons and I think it's a, uh, opportune time for us to think about, well, what can we all do individually on the personal level? And what are the policy uh, and uh, legal strategy we should be pursuing to make sure that equality and justice are some things that can truly come to light and become actual, actually enacted as they should be um, in our society. So having said that, I just want to wish everybody uh, the very best on this Juneteenth. Uh, I hope everybody has a chance to reflect on what it means, has a chance to be in community with people, and uh, just to be safe and realize that the work is still is still continuing. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to uh, participating in the, in the uh, observations from a distance. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend uh, and, and compatriot, uh, Brett Hurt, who is the CEO of Data.World. Uh, he's the founder of one of the co-founders of the Austin 100. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur and the author of The Entrepreneur's Essentials, uh, which has a chapter devoted to uh, diversity in the workplace and something that we're going to talk about. 
but he's a big supporter of Juneteenth as well. And last year uh, we had a great conversation and so much has happened since that conversation that I wanted to bring him back. So um, Brett Hurt. Hey, thanks so much, Peniel. It's a real pleasure to be with you and everybody watching this today. Now, um, you know, I wanna start with uh, this idea of the elephant in the room in terms of, uh, you know, since the year we've gotten together, uh, people talk about um, wokeness and, and, you know, that word woke has gone from being something very, very positive to almost being something very oppressive and repressive. And as somebody who's an entrepreneur and somebody who believes in capitalism, but also believes in equity, I definitely want to give you an opportunity before we really dive into uh, our conversation. What does that term woke mean to you? And why are you so interested uh, in equity um, and justice and diversity and inclusion um, in the workplace? Well, it's funny, I, you know, I wrote this article about capitalism and uh, TechCrunch decided to run it. And I had one tiny little mention of how Fox News calls it woke capitalism. And by it, I mean the B Corporation movement, the conscious capitalism movement, um, where we're all focused as entrepreneurs on evolving capitalism to be much more you know, meaningful and have a lot more intentionality. And it's funny because TechCrunch picked that up, I think, for the clickbaitiness aspect of that title. And then a lot of people didn't read the article. They just read the headline and I think, um, you know, made all types of assumptions about what's in the article. And, and I dealt with this weird kind of, you know, you know not, not, a, not an angry mob, but dealt with this weird kind of blowback. Mm -hmm. um, and if they just actually read the article, so look, throughout history, I mean, you, you know this, um, you're you know, an amazing author, you've written some of the, the best books on history and really explored um, the history of racial justice in our country. Um, there have been all types of polarizing words mm -hmm. that have been invented to continue to not address what really matters which is the inequities that exist in this country because of our history. Now, I can tell you that I truly believe that America is the best country in the world. Um, it's got the GDP to show for it. Um, people have all types of amazing freedoms and everything here. I love America, but look, we have real issues that stem from the systemic racism that is part of this country's history, starting with the original sin of slavery. Mm -hmm. And I explore this in detail in chapter 23 of my book. I've actually got it right here, the entrepreneur's essentials. And I'm not actually trying to sell anybody watching this a book um, other than to say that if you buy it, I don't get a dollar. It all goes to female entrepreneurs at UT Austin through the Kendra, the amazing Kendra's program that Kendra Scott has set up with uh, the Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute. And a lot of those uh, women showing up are women of color. It's actually the majority of the women showing up are women of color because um, they want that mentorship and help. So I, I get really frustrated with this term, you know, wokeism and wokistan, because um, it's yet just another part of American history where people are trying to create polarizing words to not address what actually matters, which is we all saw it on camera when George Floyd was murdered. It was a unifying moment for the country and political actors invent these words to get people all riled up um, to show up at the polls and vote. Um, but the reality is that we have very real issues still to address in this country. And the, and the big question is, how do we address them? And that's what I really explore in chapter 23 of my book. It's the concluding chapter of my book. And Peniel, I really need to compliment you that 
just like the original open letter I wrote on the importance of diversity in tech, where I made the case that if you build a more American company, if you build a more diverse company, you're going to have a lot more fun and perform better. And then I adapted that to chapter 23 of my book. You edited the original open letter and then you edited that chapter. And out of all my friends that I asked for help, you did more. And so I want to really thank you for that. Um, you realized that it was an important message that I was putting out there and um, you're an incredible editor and, 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 and writer. So I just want to thank you for that. Well, thank you. And, you know, I appreciate our friendship, Brett. I, I want to get into the weeds, you know, Juneteenth, we're two years after George Floyd. And certainly we all have experienced, uh, seen some progress, but also some backlash. I think what's so extraordinary about uh, the entrepreneur's essentials is that you really dive in as somebody who's been a very enormously successful entrepreneur in your belief uh, in um, not just diversity, but equity, inclusion, justice. I want to dive into that. You know, what, what, what has made you believe that so much where now you're really not only um, just an entrepreneur, you're, but you're a very visible public figure in Austin and nationally and globally, what's made you believe in equity uh, at this moment more that, you know, when we think about capitalism and making capitalism work for everyone, that equity is the key to that racial justice, gender equity, what, what's really made you sort of inspired that kind of commitment and dedication? Well, there's two parts of that answer. So let me start out with the part that to me is the most obvious part. Equity increases capitalism, period. Mm -hmm. If there are more people that have equity in this country, starting with women getting the right to vote um, almost 100 years ago, a little bit over 100 years ago, and that was just white women, we proudly support um, a cause, a nonprofit you know, media publication called The 19th, and it has an asterisk in the logo. And the asterisk means it was just for white women, and it took later for women of color to get the right to vote. Um, that created a boom in the job market. It created a boom in the capitalist market. Um, it really got women to be much more equitable with men in this country, but we still have a gap because of the way women were treated in this country with regards to wages. I mean, that gap still exists in 2022. And so we have all these gaps that exist from that original sin of slavery, which Juneteenth is all about, the liberation of slaves. Being a Jewish guy, I can tell you that almost all of our holidays are around, we persevered, we were slaves and we persevered, um, now we're prospering, let's eat. That kind of describes every Jewish holiday almost in, in, in three simple you know, well, frames. Then there's real convergence between aspects of uh, Jewish history and Black history, as you absolutely, know. and 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 Blacks and Jews were the original um, people that partnered to create equity um, in this country, and and so, you know, from a capitalist perspective, if the pie is a lot bigger and there's a lot more equity in this country, it literally lifts all boats. It lifts all boats on the job market. It lifts all boats um, in terms of people that can buy your products. I mean, there's tons and tons of studies done on this front. So just as a capitalist, it's easy to believe in because I believe in human beings, um, you know, regardless of skin color or gender or anything else. Like I am a pro-human capitalist. Um, the second thing is that, you know, you asked me why. And the second part of that is, I'm educated on it. I mean, it's, 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 it's a weird time. It's a time now after George, George Floyd where people are debating what our kids should be taught or not taught in schools. I see it happening in my own school district here. I live in uh, the wealthiest zip code in Austin. Um, that was hard fought for me. I want to just make the point that, uh, you know, when I got married, I had $1,000 and Deborah had $2,000 and we definitely had advantages because of our skin color. We definitely had advantages because of our upbringing, but we literally made it on our own. As a matter of fact, we're like, 
wow, $3,000, what are we going to do with that? That's a lot of ramen noodles. And I'm not talking about the fancy ramen noodles. I'm talking about the ramen noodles that you get in those little packages and you add water to it um, that are super cheap. And, you know, we, we have been very, uh, you know, we, we've been very lucky and we've exhibited a lot of grit to get to the point that we're in. But in my zip code, there's this fight right now on the school board. And thankfully, the school board people that we wanted to win won where they don't believe that kids should be taught about the history of this country. And I think that's crazy. It would be, you know, from a Jewish perspective, it would be like being in Germany and them saying, we don't want to teach anybody that there were Nazis here. Mm -hmm. um, look, we are not responsible as uh, white Americans. I'm speaking to white Americans on this, on this topic. We are not responsible today for what our ancestors did, okay? We are responsible for what we choose to do to create a more equitable society and to tell our kids that we're not gonna educate them on the real history of this country is crazy, in my opinion. It makes no sense at all. Um, the more educated you are, the more you can make choices about how you wanna shape society. And there are things that happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, not just in this country, but in every country in the world which would make us shameful today. And so let's get after it and let's create a more equitable society. I mean, it wasn't that long ago before, you know, gay people couldn't get married in the United States. It was not that long ago before women could not take control of their bodies and get an abortion if they wanted to. Now, crazily, we're having that fight all over again in Roe v. Wade. Um, so, you know, it's all about creating a society that lifts everybody up, increases everybody's freedoms, and increases economic prosperity. And the more educated I become, the more I believe that I have a duty as someone who's grown up in a country where it is a great melting pot and all the things that I love about this country, from the diversity of the literature to the diversity of the cities, to the diversity of the entertainment, including music, to the diversity of the businesses and the restaurants and everything, that melting pot makes America great. Like that is the American dream. So what the heck are we fighting about? Um, we're trying to reverse the clock and what are we doing? Um, and I'm not saying we as I'm trying to reverse the clock, I'm trying to advance the clock and say, we've, we've had all these gains in society Let's keep them going. And, and I really thought that the George Floyd moment was going to be the spark that led to people saying, we need to have a lot more racial justice in this country and treat each other like fellow brothers and sisters. And I think some of that has happened, but we have a long way to go. I am, I am proud of the fact that, to my knowledge, we're the first company in Austin to recognize Juneteenth as a holiday. I know for a fact we were the first tech company. Um, I can at least speak to that. Well, it's been great talking to you, Brett. Thank you so much to you and Data.World for being uh, sponsors here and on this journey. Uh, we need more people like you. And I think education, I loved what you said about education. The key to all of this is um, education and, and telling the story of Juneteenth as an American story, as part of uh, the American family. And the more people that find out about that story, uh, the closer we get to building that beloved community and getting justice and freedom for all people. So my friend, yeah. Brett Hurt, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, and for your help in this Juneteenth, uh, you know, the second annual uh, Juneteenth celebration and commemoration that we've done here at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, LBJ School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Hey, keep up the great work. And uh, I, I really uh, appreciate our friendship and it's a real honor to be invited to do this and a real honor to um, support you and your work. So thank you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you and, and everything that you do and you're about and data.world. So thank you so much.
My name is Yaki Smith, and I am the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Moody College of Communication, as well as an Associate Professor of Film in the Radio, Television, and Film Department. On June 19, 1865, freedom for the enslaved came to Texas. General Gordon Granger, accompanied by almost 4,000 troops, arrived to the port of Galveston which at that time, because of the slave trade and the amount of wealth in the form of human cargo and labor, was the wealthiest city in Texas and was also the capital of the Republic of Texas. Now, when Granger and his troops arrived, many of whom were black, by the way, they came to enforce a freedom that the inhabitants of Texas already knew about. Now, the history books we read in school tell us that they came to spread the news of freedom but that's not accurate because the news was already here. It was widespread. It was whispered about on plantations. It was talked about in social clubs. It was known widely across the state. A state whose stance was not only to keep their slaves, who were the economic engine of the region, but also to invite those from other states who wanted to keep their enslaved in bondage. They allowed those individuals to move their slaves to Texas. Now the historical record, and again, not the one that we learn in history books in school, shows us that Texas so supported slavery that it instigated and won the Texas Revolution, which allowed it to succeed from Mexico and continue the forced bondage of black people. Chattel slavery, the stilling of a people, forced passage of a people, forced labor and physical exploitation of a people, physical brutality of a people, torture, rape, forced separation, murder, and death of a people. This trauma should be America's biggest shame. However, you can't be ashamed of the thing that you refuse to acknowledge. Now, I ask you to go with me for a second and imagine the scene because it's only if you can imagine this that you can understand the significance of Juneteenth, right? Only if you can feel the whip, if you can mentally experience the thorn prickled hands, if you can allow yourself to taste the blood, to hear the cries of mothers torn from babies, fathers moaning in anguish as they were sold off, knowing that they'd never see their families again. Only if you can feel, hear, taste, smell, and touch this trauma, can you understand again the significance of Juneteenth? That on this day, although the path to absolute freedom was still have to and still is being journeyed towards, those who had suffered under the fate of slavery would now have ownership over their own bodies and would finally have the freedom that they so desired. Now, for as long as I can remember, uh, we celebrated Juneteenth. We celebrated just like we celebrated the 4th of July. And actually we celebrated more on Juneteenth than we did on the 4th of July. We had barbecues, parades, there was singing, there was dancing. We celebrated with tears, with laughter, joy, sometimes even sadness as we remembered what our ancestors had endured. We honored them because we knew that if they hadn't survived, hadn't harnessed their God-given power to overcome, that they, that we would have never walked into the promised land of freedom. As we celebrated, we could feel them with us, speaking to us, rejoicing alongside us, moving through us at the cookouts as we stanky leg, wobble, Cupid shuffle, did the cha-cha slide, twerk, jerk, doogie. We harnessed the electrical current of liberation in our church services as we shouted, as we spoke in tongues, as we fell out in the spirit, and as Baby Suggs Holy and Toni Morrison's beloved urge us, beloved, sorry, urge us to do, we loved our flesh and our heart because we knew that loving those parts, finally being able to love those parts the way we saw fit, 
that that was the true prize of freedom. That's what June 19, 1865, Jubilee Day, Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, Black Liberation Day, Juneteenth. That's what it's all about. It's a day to commemorate liberation, freedom, and new beginnings for all those who suffered through the trauma of slavery. It's a day to remember and a day to continue strategizing what true liberation looks like. Now to that end, I now invite you to view the trailer for my latest film, Juneteenth, Faith and Freedom, which is now streaming at juneteenth.experiencevoices.com. Again, that's juneteenth.experiencevoices.com. And this film details slavery and emancipation in Texas, and it offers new insight into the now federally recognized holiday. We interview descendants of the emancipated, of those emancipated on Juneteenth, some who still, some who still live on the island of Galveston. We talk to historians, genealogists. We visit former slave plantations. We visit the site of the first Juneteenth celebration. We visit the site where the emancipated traveled to after learning the news that they had been emancipated. We visit Freeman's town in Houston, where many of the former enslaved moved to after emancipation. And we talk to 2022 Nobel Peace Prize nominee, the grandmother of Juneteenth, Ms. Opal Lee. Now this film is a tribute to the formerly enslaved. It's a call to action for everyone who believes in true freedom. And it's a historical document that will hopefully be showed far and wide for years to come. I now invite you to watch the trailer and then head over and watch the film. Happy Juneteenth Day. The paper said on the 19th of June, 500 people gather. Paper says the police couldn't control the mob. Wait, hold on. So the 500 people that gathered, this wasn't a Juneteenth celebration? <laughs> Not by a long shot. Was what happened on June 19th, 1865 in Texas, really the end of slavery in America? Slavery at its essence is control. And so what happens in the South is a struggle to control. The mentality of the state seemed to have been, we're not gonna let them go. You can miss the humanity when you emphasize 10 million slaves, right? We wanna talk about someone's son, someone's daughter. Now, June 19th, 1865, somebody got freedom. Somebody's child got freedom. Somebody's mama got freedom. Somebody's grandmama got freedom. And when that happened, that's like an exodus experience all over again. You can just imagine. You find out you're free, there's a party on every corner, <laughs> of course. But then there was the reality. What next? What does Juneteenth reveal about the nature of the struggle for freedom? How did a Bible that was used to justify slavery become an inspiration for liberation. I say, hey, we should care about the poor. Yes, amen. Hey, we should care about the marginalized. Yes, amen. Hey, we should care about injustice for black people. Whoa, whoa, brother, You're going too far. And it crushed me. This is not just a story for Texans or for those like me seeking to connect with their roots. Juneteenth is the story of faith's power to overcome suffering, good to overcome evil, and how a people's fight for freedom was delayed, but could not be denied. Here I come. Don't sound like you're slowing down any at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's work to do. <laughs> <laughs>